dance showed me that there are no limits. I never say I'm a fashion designer. I've always felt like a director. And the clothes I did were a direction of the everyday. Manfred Thierry Mugler unfortunately passed on the 23rd of January 2022. He leaves behind a massive creative legacy, a body of work stretching across fashion, fragrance, cinema and music. His singular creative vision and determination led him on a path to be a self-made man, a world beater and an icon. He will be remembered for his creating signature looks for luminaries like David Bowie, Madonna, Diana Ross, and Grace Jones. And perhaps most notably, was responsible for Demi Moore's iconic dress in Indecent Proposal. His work continued into the 21st century, working closely with Lady Gaga, the Kardashians, and Cardi B as well as crafting costumes for Beyonce's I Am World Tour. Mugler was born in 1948 in Strasbourg, France showing signs of creativity from as young as nine, where he claimed to be more interested in drawing than school. He also studied dance from a younger age, leading him to join the ballet of the National Rhine Opera at age 14. Studying for six years, he learned the value of performance and showmanship, which would inform his career as a designer. In addition, he also attended the Strasbourg School of Decorative Art, which led him to creating and designing his own clothes. After this six-year period, age 20, he moved to Paris and began working for a boutique called Goudoul. Two years later, he began freelance work for ready-to-wear fashion houses in Paris, London, Milan and Barcelona. In 1973, Mugler launched his first clothing line, Café de Paris. Fellow visionary Azadine Alaya joined him in working on his early designs, their collaboration lasting until the late 70s, where Mugler encouraged Alaya to launch his own career. The following year, Mugler created his own label. In 1976, fashion editor Melka Trienten asked him to show his collection in Tokyo, and two years later, Mugler opened his first boutique in Paris. At the same time, he launched a one-off mail collection. Subsequent collections from his newly established fashion house began to garner more attention from the fashion world at large. One of his first collections that put Mugler on the map was the 1984-85 Fall Winter Ready to Wear collection. To celebrate the 10th anniversary of his brand, Mugler opened the first ever runway show performance to the public in the West. In full 1980s effusion, fashion came together with the theatre and music worlds more than ever before in this highly colourful production which drew more than 6,000 spectators. On the runway, 350 outfits paraded past the audience. Women adorned with halos and gold wings were the angels in this collection, pushing the wonder to its paroxysm. With the majestic descent of Pat Cleveland from the ceiling, a Madonna-like figure draped in celestial and starry finery. Another noted collection from Mugler is the 1989 Ready to Wear Spring Summer Collection, also known as Mugler and His Mermaids. The aquatic world has always been a source of inspiration for the designer, and in the Le Atlantis collection, he drew upon this inspiration to create the tale of an abyss people by mermaids. 
His trademark structured suits, along with more experimental works like metallic dresses and jumpsuits, made up the collection. Perhaps the most well-known aspect, though, was the shell-like bustiers made from canted glass, which gave the models who wore them Mugler's desired effect of an otherworldly quality, which was the beginning of a long creative partnership between the two. Following on from this collection, another well-known piece of Mugler's fashion legacy is the 1989-90 Fall Winter Collection. Reflecting Mueller's well-known love for classic automobiles of the 50s, the garments he designed for this collection were intended as an attempt to capture the powerful lines where metal and reflectors meet fabric. A very literal example was the famous bodywork bustier, Roulez comme un Buick, Drive like a Buick, worn by Naomi Campbell and made once again in collaboration with Jean-Jacques Erken. Illustrating the fantastical spirit of Mugler, known for mixing humor and sensuality. These collections were noticed by the right people. And in 1992, Mugler was invited to join the very closed club of Couture as an invited member and present his first Couture collection. At the time, Haute Couture was somewhat ironically suffering from a bit of an image crisis, being perceived as suffering from a distinct lack of modernity and daring and tiring both buyers and the press. For this collection, the designer chose the splendid setting of the Ritz swimming pool, which also gave its name to the collection. For the event, he invited some 20 seamstresses to his atelier to work with him on the creation of unique pieces articulated around the corset. The result was a collection of remarkable precision, where the unerring sense of detail exalted the creativity. His immediate success earned the designer a permanent haute couture membership that lasted for 10 years. For the 1995-96 haute couture collection, which also coincided with his house's 20th anniversary, Mugler, being Mugler, organized a special celebration, playing a sort of greatest hits of his design career a lot of the show revisited iconic figures from his past collection. Among the notable new creations from this collection were the gynoid robots and chrome outfits, resulting from an intensive collaboration with Erkan around the idea of the female android. Starting with a metal bra, it evolved into an all-in-one, made from metal and plexiglass, a truly influential design. Throughout each of these collections and their public launches, Mugler worked hard to build his fashion empire by using the supermodels of the day and celebrity supporters to promote the brand by walking in his shows. He had long-standing creative friendships with Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, Nadja Auerman, and Jerry Hall, among others. I made clothes because I was looking for something that didn't exist. I had to try and create my own world. A signature of his work was his use of muses to inspire and inform his designs. The most famous of these is probably David Bowie. Bowie partially owes his status as an iconic androgyny to Mugler's designs, as many of his memorable looks were created by the fashion house through the 70s and 80s. Most notably, the wedding tucks and dresses worn by him and his backup dancers for his performance on Saturday Night Live were all Mugler designs. Mugler's tendency to use muses to challenge defined gender norms is also reflected in his work in the 90s with gender-bending models like Connie Fleming and Terry Toy. A good 30 years before this kind of representation and inclusion came into vogue. Mugler used these models as muses for his latest collection, yet another aspect of his work that set him apart from his contemporaries.
Beyond the realms of fashion, Mugler also garnered a lot of attention and fame for his work in perfumes. The fragrance is a project I've been working for 10 years. And it's a great perfume, very new. It's actually opening a new direction on perfume because there's a fragrance and essence in it that we had to specially made, create to do this, this fragrance. And it's just things that have never been used like, like chocolate and coffee and stuff like that. And it's very tender and also very smart. In 1992, the first campaign for the fragrance Angel was released. Mugler's aim with Angel was fairly straightforward, to create a scent that people would want to eat, using memories from his childhood of sweets, aiming for a smell of chocolate and caramel, a classic juice that a little boy would give to his mother. This was a unique standout in the world of perfumes at the time, as it was based in sweet, raw materials rather than the floral bouquets common in perfumes. The scent was a reinterpretation of oriental trails that initiates a new genre, the gourmand, with its captivating notes of vanilla, red fruits, praline, and patchouli. Add to that a dash of color, blue in fact, which is the colour of the company, a Mugler had made a new mark on the world of perfume. Accompanying this bold and innovative new fragrance was an iconic advertising campaign. The first campaign in 1992 had Estelle Lefebure on the side of a Manhattan skyscraper. Estelle herself was dressed fairly simply in a black Mugler suit and blue scarf. However, she played with the blue scarf, allowing it to catch the wind, and it is this image that is used in the campaign. It emphasizes the blue associated both with the fragrance and with the brand more generally. I can't remember the building, but it was near Times Square. Security guards in America are much stricter than they are in Europe, so I always had to distract them so that Thierry could have Estelle get much closer to the edge than they would allow. Christophe de Latayad, Mugler's creative director and overseer of the iconic Angel campaigns. This bold imagery, combined with a unique scent, became signatures of the Angel brand. The idea of a woman on the edge of the building was reprised in the 2003 campaign, with model Anna Maria Say laying on the edge of one of the most famous Chrysler building gargoyles, 80 floors up. Superimposed against a futuristic cityscape, she appears in a beautiful, shimmering blue dress and holds aloft the bottle of perfume. Thierry had imagined a story of a girl who wants to escape this world that she's not pleased with, so she takes refuge on top of a skyscraper. And what you see in the ad is a backdrop that's actually a combination of Hong Kong and Tokyo. We were very inspired by Blade Runner. We shot this in a rented movie theatre in Paris because we couldn't find a studio that was large enough to accommodate the fake rooftop. We couldn't find a studio that was large enough to accommodate the fake rooftop we built with lights under it. It was so hot that we called it the toaster. We could only leave her on it for 30 minutes, otherwise she would have been burned. Nineteen ninety two was a very busy year for Mugler indeed. In addition to launching his first haute couture collection and foraying into the perfume world with Angel, George Michael, hot off the success of his video for the single Freedom ninety, hired Mugler to direct the successor, Too Funky. What followed was a clash of two titanic egos, a lot of nervous tiptoeing around these men and ultimately an artistic triumph, as the clip for Too Funky is looked back upon very fondly. The video for Too Funky was made to make money for AIDS research. George wanted to hire Mugler because his shows were like cabarets. It was more like going to a theatre show than a fashion show, and this taste for the theatrical was obviously a big part of the appeal for George. In the early 90s, making a standout film clip was a big part of a song's success. Another thing Mugler had going for him was his network, 
with his working relationships comprising a veritable who's who of supermodels at the time. Mugler's vision for the clip was to show the difference between the backstage chaos and what is presented to the viewer during a couture show. The hysteria and high-strung energy that propels any stage show and the stark contrast as the models hit the runway. The ideal being a statuesque, emotionless beauty. It reflected Mugler's ideas of the superhuman, with no one being just mediocre. It was about his adoration of the human form and pushing how far it can go. It was also a showcase for Mugler's fascinating and imaginative designs, combining stylistic elements from classic fashion with machinery, particularly automobiles, but also reflecting on nature, Americana and authority figures. The story played up the role of the authoritative designer, with Joey Aria playing the Edith head type authority figure in drag. This kind of tongue-in-cheek send-up is exactly the kind of cheeky aesthetic choice Mugler was famous for. However, only two days into the five-day shoot, the production had already exceeded the planned $1 million budget. It is here that the George Michael and Thierry Mugler had their legendary stoush with one another. At one point, two or three days into it, George said, Okay, I got what I need. And Manfred said, okay, but I'm not done. I'm still shooting and we've got two more days. And George said, no, I think we're done. And then there was a big fight. Manfred said, I'm not done. And George said, I said, we're done. Then George said, well, you know what? I'm the one who's the superstar here, not you. And then Mueller just snapped. Then there was a fight and everyone was sitting like, what the heck is going on? And then Linda Evangelista was kind of the go-between. And there was a meeting in the back for two hours, I think. And then they both walked out arm in arm. And I could see that Manfred was a little like, mm. so they were laughing. And they said, we're going to continue shooting and we're going to finish this up. And then George started looking behind the lens and he put those stills in himself later on. Despite this spat, the crew, all of whom were donating their time as it was for charity, pulled together and finished the clip. It was excessive, glamorous, and visually arresting. Exactly what you might expect from a collaboration between Michael and Mugler. Despite these days not being quite as well known as the Freedom 90 clip, it is truly one of a kind and a bit of a time capsule of the age of excess combining with the golden age of music clip production. The logistics of the production seem nearly impossible on paper, as the sheer number of models and actresses involved beggars belief. So the fact it happened at all is something of a minor miracle. A photograph must come from imagination and not be a reflection of what is. In addition to his work as a designer, perfumer, and director, Mugler was also an accomplished photographer. Born out of his desire to exert a fair amount of creative control over his brand, particularly during its early stages, he would often shoot the campaigns himself. This then expanded to a love of photography more broadly. As he traveled through various continents for fashion, he would also carry a camera and take opportunities where inspiration struck. Ultimately, this resulted in the publication of two books. The first, simply titled Thierry Mugler, Photographer, was released in 1989. It contains a variety of images, both fashion-related and not. The book takes readers on a journey around the world, from the Algerian Sahara to Greenland's iceberg-dotted Disco Bay. Perhaps one of the most well-known images in the book is from his travels in Russia, where while on the outskirts of Volgograd, he discovered a 66-foot red star, a relic of the Soviet era, and asked Angela Wilde to climb it, capturing her on the left arm of the star. The book also features a pre-fame Jimon Honsu and others who were part of various campaigns. Ultimately, 
Mugler's photographic style is a reflection of his wider artistic philosophy. With a focus on a larger-than-life aesthetic, shot in an otherworldly fashion, and features models on top of impressive or monumental buildings, or heroically posed with an epic natural wonder. Mugler's second book, Fashion, Fetish and Fantasy, is a reflection on his 20-year involvement in the industry. It takes a look through his catalogue and his ability to stretch the boundaries of style and imagination. Examining the showmanship and imagination that go into the fashion shows he has presented to the world throughout his career. The book combines Mugler's sketches with photography from the world's best fashion photographers to offer the reader a unique insight into the processes behind the iconic fashion shows the Mugler brand is known for. The book features his frequent collaborations with both the cream of the crop of supermodels, Jerry Hall, Cindy Crawford, Naomi Campbell, Christy Turlington, Claudia Schiffer, Kate Moss, and many other celebrated personalities, David Bowie, Julie Numa, Ivana Trump, Sharon Stone, James Brown, and Diana Ross. It's a celebration of his diverse, interesting body of work. During the early 2000s, Mueller underwent a bit of a career shift that reflected his changing interests in creativity. Looking to move beyond the world of fashion, he took a step back from the house he founded and still bore his name in 2003 to mainly focus on the creation of perfumes. When asked about the subject, he said, fashion is beautiful, 3D art on a human being, but it wasn't enough which is why I went on to create in other ways. For me, it wasn't the right tool anymore, but perfume still interests me. In 2002, he collaborated with Cirque du Soleil, directing Extravaganza, which is a scene from the show Zumanity, and created the costumes and character identities for the show. 2005 saw the release of another iconic perfume, Alien, also opening the Thierry Mugler Perfume Workshops and the aim to teach the craftsmanship and knowledge to make fragrances. Following this, Mugler's foray into cosmetics became more and more prominent, as in 2007 he launched a collection of five more fragrances with a view towards what he called perfume trickery to enhance one's presence. In 2008, the Mugler brand launched Thierry Mugler Beauty, a high-end line of cosmetics. During this period, while having officially retired from the formal role of fashion designer, he began to collaborate directly with certain celebrities. In 2009, for example, he worked as the artistic advisor to Beyonce, working closely with her on the design aesthetic for her I Am World Tour. His designs saw a resurgence during this time, with Lady Gaga featuring them in the music video for Telephone, and Cardi B, who had an extensive friendship with Mugler, often wearing his vintage designs for photo shoots and red carpet events, and mentioning the brand in the song Wild Side. Mugler's last piece of fashion design fittingly brought his career full circle, coming out of retirement under the name House of Mugler. Mugler's last piece of fashion design fittingly brought his career full circle, coming out of retirement under the name House of Mugler, for a one-time creation for Kim Kardashian. Inspired by Sophia Loren in the film Boy on a Dolphin, Mugler envisioned a wet California girl, hence the creation of the now iconic wet couture dress. During this period, at the company he had left behind, several creative directors came and went. Perhaps the most notable of these was Nicola Formichetti. Formichetti is an award-winning magazine creative director, fashion stylist, and a fashion designer in his own right. He is most widely known for being the long-time artistic collaborator with Lady Gaga, being responsible for iconic looks like the metal orb dress and the meat dress, as well as the creative director for Diesel. Former Chetty took the role of creative director at Mugler in 2010. He was, in many ways, a logical successor to the company's founder. 
being an eclectic designer whose imagination incorporates both classical fashion beats with modern sensibilities and a twist unique to him as a creator. Joel Palix, director general of the company, said we were looking for a young talent who could really bring energy to the brand. Nicola is a multicultural, techno-savvy expert involved in fashion, communication, image and entertainment. He and the appointed talent designers will represent a new direction for French fashion. Nicola Formuchetti leaves Mugler on April 2nd, 2013. Formuchetti's debut line at the company was a menswear line which made its debut at Men's Paris Fashion Week on the 19th of January 2011. Much of his approach reflected early Mugler, from having a muse zombie boy, the full-body tattooed Canadian model Rick Genest, to his designs recalling classic looks from Mugler's early work as a designer. In the use of certain colors like navy blue and bright orange, and the use of latex in the creation of certain garments like trousers and biker jackets. For Maketi himself, says on the collection, I want to say something that has the past and the future, but what is really important to me is the present. Mugler's creative choices as a designer were truly one of a kind. His influences included the glamour designs of the 1940s and 50s, with a lot of his early work focusing on the architectural, broad shoulder, narrow waist look prominent in that era. The use of plastic-like futuristic fabric in his sculpted clothing became another trademark. His style has been described as ultimate femme fatale, structured elegance with a feminine silhouette that is accentuated by the sharp cuts. I want to show weird beauty, I want to show the beauty through the age, I want to show the courage. It's not that easy to be a woman, so I want to show it. Fashion is a movie. Every morning when you get dressed, you direct yourself. Like so much creative work, both inside the fashion industry and outside, Mugler's work taking place in the 1970s was also a massive influence on the stylistic approach taken. The postmodern leanings of this era, in a general sense, simultaneously embracing the past and the future, led to monumental shifts in the creative landscape in a general sense. This is reflected in the work of Mugler as his work is defined by a certain boldness, a willingness to try new and dangerous things that were unheard of in the world of high fashion. His designs were sometimes criticized for their extravagance, but given the era he was working in, extravagance was almost to be expected. As the 80s rolled around particularly, Mugler is known to have defined 80s power dressing. Occasionally, his designs resembled robotic suits with protruding cone shapes. Other times, he stretched the limits of couture and fashion by using materials like rubber, painted latex, plexiglass, and metal to manipulate and transform the female body. This approach was unheard of at the time and drew a fair amount of criticism from some, but also garnered Mugler a lot of success. From building the brand from the ground up Mugler is now a worldwide fashion brand. He based collections on comics, insects, Soviet iconography, video games, cyberspace, and being a motorcycle, the jackets were designed to look like engines. His avant-garde approach to fashion design would influence a generation of new, bold designers. Fashion philosophy is more a philosophy by itself than a fashion philosophy. Because I think uh, I'm just taking care of making uh, human beings, especially women, looking beautiful. And it's not so much about fashion, it's more about look and efficiency of uh, basic, of glamour, will always make you look good. It's not about intellectual ideas. I just want to help. I just want to see beautiful women. I realized I was living in my own universe with lots of assistants. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't know how to use a computer. Everybody was doing everything for me. So I left and moved to New York. It was the end of an era, and I must say I found myself a bit lost. I wasn't in the protected Mugler universe anymore. From a show-stopping, attention-grabbing master of ceremonies to a reclusive scent maker, 
Mugler's latest career transition is interesting and not altogether unexpected, having worked very hard to establish himself and his brand. Taking a backward step as he aged is something that is very relatable. That's not to say he lost his work ethic, but just channeled his energy into a different and less publicized field. His work in the field of cosmetics, and in particular perfumes, came to define the latter half of his career. His interest in this field grew beyond creating as well, when he established the Thierry Mugler perfume workshops in the hope of introducing others to his passion. During his later life, however, Mugler was perhaps best known for the drastic changes to his physical appearance. Although many in his position have gone down the plastic surgery route for vanity's sake, Mugler was actually the victim of a couple of motoring accidents, which were the primary factor for him undergoing these procedures. Firstly, his nose was destroyed in a jeep crash. A subsequent motorcycle accident involving steel cables and saw Mugler have a piece of metal removed from his leg. In an interview with Interview Magazine, Mugler stated, I asked another surgeon if he could do some things to my chin, and then I was happy to get the bloody anesthesia. He actually took a piece of bone from my hip and put it in my chin, so I don't have any plastic or silicone. It's all bones. I wanted my face to represent progress, because after years of being a thin, charming dancer, I wanted to be a warrior. I've done so much in my life. I've fought so much. I'm a superhero, so it's normal to have the face of one. In addition to the changes in his face, he also had more time to focus on another passion, bodybuilding. He had always taken care of his physique, but post-2003 saw him present as a far more muscular than he had in the past. When looking back at Mugler's life and work, nailing down his legacy is difficult to put into words. Deliberately provocative, often cheeky and a little bit sexy, Mugler took classical influences from his childhood and combined them with the postmodern artistic revolution of the 70s blending these elements to create a unique and fascinating body of work as a designer. His talents have been recognized not only in his time, but by contemporary fashion forward icons like Gaga and Cardi B. Following his death, an outpouring of grief on social media from some of the biggest names in their fields reflect just how important Mugler was. Everyone from Beyonce to the Kardashians to Diana Ross have taken to various forms on social media to reflect their grief. Beyonce posted a succession of photos showing off her looks designed by Mugler, whereas Ross paid tribute to him via Twitter. It is a loss that was felt keenly across the industry. Not only was he a boundary-breaking designer, but his bold and uncompromising vision also extended to the way he lived his life. Openly gay, in a much less accepting time, he was also iconic in the LGBT community. He was one of the first designers to champion diversity in his runway shows, which often tackled racism and ageism. His shows often featured models that were different from the norm, older women, transgender, gender-fluid individuals, and curvy plus-sized models. It's above all an emotional impact, a personality, a character, something harmonious, I'm very drawn to architecture and the structure of the human face, so I search for beauty of all types, regardless of geographical origin. I like to find a true example or an extreme for every type of beauty. Mugler has had a massive impact on the worlds of fashion and beauty, whether people have been conscious of it or not. Daring to push the envelope and challenge the status quo, his designs would inspire contemporaries to embrace their own unique style and not to be confined to the rules of fashion. Mugler once said that he was not afraid to die for beauty. This was in reference to a photo shoot where he had a model pose on the top of the Chrysler building in New York. But in a broader sense, I feel it reflects his approach to his life and career. He prioritized what he saw as beauty above all else and the pursuit of representing that beauty is what defined him as a person. Starting from the bottom, working his way into the upper echelon of the fashion world, Mugler was a true renegade in that he did it on his own terms, 
trusting in his own ability to bring his vision of beauty to the world. I think that if you work in this industry, it's to contribute something constructive. That's my philosophy. That's why I don't watch violent films. I don't understand horror movies and all that. It's a lack of respect for women who are murdered in real life. Those are realities. But there are also marvelous things in this world. So let's talk a bit about the marvelous things. It's much harder to rise above things than to wallow in them.